Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I've been strengthening brands through PR for over 35 years, and now I'm celebrating the success of executives, influencers, business owners, and entrepreneurs from all around the world, all of whom have cultivated their brands and broadened their networks through traditional and digital networking methods. Each week, I interview one of these interesting and influential individuals and provide an opportunity for you, the PR Maven Nation, to gain insights from their strategies and stories. So stay tuned for this week's episode, and thanks for listening. I want to welcome to the studio here at the Portland Pod today, Katie Rollins Del Signori, who's a senior shopper marketing manager at Coca-Cola. Katie grew up in Augusta, Maine, where she was a three-sport athlete and graduated in 2005 from Coney High School as Maine Athlete of the Year. Katie was a four-year starter for the women's basketball team at Harvard, that is Harvard, in Boston, Massachusetts, (laughs) and she graduated in 2009 with her BA in Psychology. Katie is the subject of a Showtime documentary called No Look Pass, which followed her and her Harvard roommate, Emily Tay, during their basketball careers in college and then overseas upon their graduation. When she came back to the United States, Katie started working at Coca-Cola as a category analyst, interpreting data on shopper behavior and trends to help guide brand strategy. She then transitioned to a sales role, managing the Coca-Cola portfolio in 3,000 CVS pharmacies across the East Coast. For the past three years, she has been a sports marketing manager, a job that many people would consider to be a dream job, managing Coke's contracts with the Red Sox, the Bruins, and the Celtics, all of the great sports teams of Boston. She has recently transitioned to a shopper marketing role, calling on CVS pharmacies and managing all of Coca-Cola branding, advertising, and marketing programs nationally. Katie resides in South Boston, Massachusetts, with her husband, Edward Del Signori. So to kick things off, tell us about your career and how you got into it in the first place. I've had a pretty interesting um, path because I started playing basketball at a young age at took me through high school and college, and then I actually had the opportunity to play professionally overseas. Um, So I played professional basketball in Fearnheim, Germany. Um, So that was like 2009 is when I graduated. The economy wasn't great. You know, it was really hard to get a job graduating right after school. And so it was not only a way to, you know, travel the world, keep my basketball career going, which was such a, you know, a privilege to even have that opportunity, but also kind of a way to like delay the real world a little bit and and suck a little more life out of my youth maybe and just be able to travel um so i I think you're still pretty youthful (laughs) i dare say but even back then right so like 10 years ago but um so i i went to germany with my best friend from college one of our point guards her name was emily um and we played professionally together lived in the same apartment we're on the same team and you know traveled all over europe basically for free which is amazing and got paid to work out and play basketball and um, it was just, it was an unbelievable experience. And then we actually, and I don't even know if I've talked to you about this, had the privilege of um, being um, a subject of a documentary called No Look Pass. A girl that actually played at Harvard as well um, is a filmmaker. And she kind of saw our friendship and saw where we were going and said, hey, I'd love to film you guys just to see where this goes because it's your life. You don't know what's going to happen the next week, the next month. And um, she started following us around actually my senior year of college. And then um, followed us for the year in Germany and ended up making this full length hour and a half documentary about just this coming of age of how we were friends. I was from Maine. She's from L.A. We're from opposite parts of the country. We have no business kind of even forming this friendship. She's this tiny, you know, 5'4 Asian. I'm this tall, you know, Caucasian, loud, like, girl. (laughs) And um, we ended up playing, you know, she she followed us and she ended up um, actually selling the documentary to Showtime. And it was on Showtime for a few months and won all these awards. And 
So now we've got this like great documentary of our experience wow. playing can overseas. Can find it? Can we? They can, yeah. It's on iTunes. Um, it's called No Look Pass and you can buy it or rent it. And oh, great. Well, judge definitely. it for yourself. We'll, and link, see. we'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. see a little like sneak peek of what that experience was like. So, awesome. you know, that was amazing coming right out of college. And then while I was there, I was applying for a ton of jobs for when I would come home and I think I probably sent out like 80 or 90 resumes and I heard back from five. Um, and of those five, I only got one interview. So you want to talk about like casting this wide net and just being so frustrated and disappointed week after week. And I was like, thank God I started searching for a job while I'm still here rather than when I got home because it was just tough. And even for a Harvard graduate and you think you've done everything right and you think you've got, you know, you went to college, you got the degree, you studied hard. And it's like, oh, my God, like it was just a it was a tough time for anybody to be hiring and getting a job back then. So I um, ended up starting at um, PEP. It's called um, Promotional Execution Partners, and it's a contractor of Procter & Gamble. So they were the one that gave me the interview, and I got the job, and I was like, that's all it takes, right? One of one, and that's fine. So I um, I started with them out of the Gillette factory in South Boston, and I was doing a lot of promotional work for them on their designer fragrances. So Lacoste, Dolce & Gabbana. I was basically designing like gift with purchases and those gift box that you get with the fragrances and coupons and displays and Oh yeah, <laughs> you know I've it well. Got a lot of those floral boxes yeah. in my closet. And amount- I have a sucker. That, it's like I have a sign on my forehead. <laughs> yeah, anything to make it flashy right. and people want to pick it up. So did that. I mean, the amount that I know about paper thickness and paper quality, and you're like, how do I have all this information in my head? Um, and so I only did that for about six to eight months. Um, what ended up happening was I just found myself not growing in the job. My boss, I was 22. My boss was 24. Everyone in the office was under the age of 30, um, and I was talking to a family friend who sort of was an a informal mentor. Um, his name was Rich Barouche, and he had previously worked at Procter & Gamble, but was actually my uncle's friend through Clorox and Kingsford. Um, but they'd been longtime family friends, and I was just kind of chatting with him about how I felt like I wasn't growing, I wasn't getting the mentorship I needed, like I'm early in my career, I feel like I'm just doing something for a paycheck rather than progressing. And he totally agreed. Um, And he was actually just hired as a VP at Coca-Cola. And so he said to me, okay, if you had your ideal job, what would it be? And I described to him um, a job that I didn't even know what the title was. I'm just describing things I'm interested in. And I said to him, you know, I'm I'm interested in why people shop, how they shop, you know, why are they attracted to something at eye level and not at the bottom shelf? Or why are we attracted to a red can instead of a blue can? And You know, I'd love to learn more about why we behave the way we do and how marketers tap into that. And he said, well, it sounds to me like you're describing a category analyst or a shopper insight job. And I was like, oh, is that what it's called? Like I had, you know, I was just so early on, I didn't know. And he had actually been hired to lead category analytics at Coke. Oh, that gives me the chills. And and it's sort of just meant to be, right? (laughs) It's like you didn't even know you were talking to the guy that's running that team for, you know, a global brand like Coke. And um, he actually had an opening in Boston and said, I think, this sounds like the perfect fit. And it was just, it snowballed very quickly. And I interviewed and got the job. And that's kind of how I started my career at Coke was just that one, that one informal mentor and just the stars aligned and the and the timing worked out. And it just happened to be something I was super passionate about and interested in. So, I mean, I could go into my career at Coke and the roles I've had. I don't know if. Yeah, I'd love to hear. Yeah. yeah. So I, um, so I ended up starting on his team. And I would say I was totally in over my head. I was pretty <laughs> underqualified for what I think people thought I was capable of. So totally fake it till you make it. Yeah. Um, you know, I had no... Were you ex- going home at night Googling? <laughs> YouTubing everything, Googling. You're laughing, but I like, I had to Sorry. take... No, I love it. I had to... I actually signed up. So a big part of, obviously, uh, data analytics is Excel. And I had never even used Excel. I mean, my Excel knowledge on a scale of one to 10 was like a negative two. Like I had never even opened up the icon on my desktop. And <laughs> here these people are think I'm like an Excel guru. And I was like, okay, well, I can't like show my true colors. I got to figure it out. So I actually signed up for classes at a local Holiday Inn on Saturdays for four Saturdays in a row and didn't tell anybody that here I am like taking this beginner's Excel class just to show you know just to prove base minimum for what they were (laughs) expecting um but so it was scary that was like a really scary time and i think um i was young um professionally you know i've I've always had a maturity about myself but this business acumen and just simply like the professional maturity of managing your calendar and managing your emails and um you know it's 
it just felt like I was thrown into this different world that no one had really ever prepared you for. It's like, interesting. They don't teach that at Harvard. I know, right? <laughs> the things they don't teach you at Harvard, uh, right. email management. But it's, I mean, it's just totally different. You go from using your email socially to having to use your email professionally, right? So, you know, back in the day, like you're not going to use smiley face emojis in your emails. I mean, that's, right. that feels obvious. Um but there's just little things that like a 22 year old just doesn't quite. Although isn't sometimes quite polished. I do, and now I do, right? <laughs> now I feel like we've got the liberty. It's kind of all come full circle, and right. now you know you want to have a great relationship with your clients. You're very casual. You're very colloquial. Um, but um, so just I had some polishing to do. I had a really good manager at Coke that helped me do that. Um, but you know, I basically took something that was a complete weakness in data analytics and Excel and made it a total strength. And now. You know, Excel offers a lot, so I'm sure people listening would, would argue. I'm no, I'm no guru, but I'm definitely an above average user. And I think that's the most positive thing that came out of that that job is that this was something I had no business even in. And now, you know, I could teach an Excel class. And so, you know, for me, that was a win with that role. And I think it was a perfect way to start my career. Um, you know, everything's based in numbers and data. And every decision we make at Coke is based on trends and ROI and what is the data telling us. So to be able to learn how to interpret numbers and translate those into decisions and actionable behavior um, was just a great place to start. And it taught me a ton about our portfolio, about our customers' portfolio, about our competitors' portfolio. Um, So that was the perfect baseline, even though it was the most difficult job I've had at Coke so far. Um, But it's not quite my personality. Um, It's a, you know, a solo job inside of a cubicle and you're crunching numbers all day. And I'm much more of a people person and I wanted to get out in front of the customer. So I Ended up transitioning to a role on the CBS team in sales. Um, so each team at Coke um, has a, a retailer that they're associated with. So there's a Walgreens team, a Walmart team, a McDonald's team. I was on the CBS team. I was in charge of 3,000 um, CVS locations from the Mid-Atlantic out to Ohio up to Maine. Um, and basically in charge of the Coke portfolio within those 3,000 CVS stores. So what was on ad? What was on display? How did we look? What were the planograms looking like? holding all of our teams accountable on the ground level to making sure that Coke was on the shelves and ready to sell. What is um, a planogram? That's a good question. So <laughs> basically, and um, the average customer probably doesn't even realize, but every shelf, every cooler has a map of what product belongs where. Mm. And there's a ton of data and money going behind placement for each of the products, which we call SKUs. So right. Coke Classic in a 20 ounce is a different SKU than Coke Classic in a 16 ounce can is a different skew than like a Pepsi in a 20 ounce. So we create maps of what product belongs in what section where, and it's very prescriptive and it's very purposeful. And, you know, you see the data will tell you like sales will dramatically increase or decrease depending on your placement in this planogram. Um, So the best selling items are placed at eye level. Um, They're placed in the front. Your new items are placed by the door handle because people tend to look at the door handle while they're opening it. They'll notice it. Um, so we're very deliberate in where we we place all of our products. On and shelf. you pay for that placement, especially premium placement. We right? do, yeah, yeah. Whether it's through case funding or advertising funding or promotional programs, there's a there's definitely a cost associated associated to each one. And um, sometimes with innovation and some of our new items, we'll just pay a, a flat fee and say, yep, that we want this in this many stores, and and you know we work with the customer to make sure that happens. Now, one thing I'm really interested in is I thought that part of your job now was organizing events and sponsorships. And yes. I'm really interested in the idea of bringing people together under the Coca-Cola brand. Yeah. So, and, and that's totally what our brand's about, right? Like bringing people together, curating these moments. Um, and a lot of our strategy and marketing is not so much putting our brand front and center, but creating those moments where our brand is simply just a part of it. And I think everyone has their Coke story and their Coke moment, whether it's you remember sipping an ice cold Coke on the beach with your family or, you know, your grandfather used to hand you an ice cold Coke in a glass bottle back in the day. You know, everyone's got that moment where they attribute the taste to that memory. And that's kind of the foundation of our brand is that we don't want to be so brand forward that it's right in your face and you're like, okay, Coca-Cola, we get it. What we want to be part of is meeting our customers in the moments that they're already experiencing and just becoming part of that moment inherently for them. Um, so part of my my job after I transli- transitioned from that sales role was into sports marketing. Um, so I managed our contract for Coca-Cola with the Red Sox, the Bruins, the Celtics, the Buffalo Sabres. I also had some NASCAR tracks. Six Flags was a big um, customer of mine. And that's just been an unbelievably like 
dream dream come true <laughs> dream job if i could retire in it i would have so wow. yeah I, I don't think it gets much better than that with yeah. our brands and those brands partnering and so that's when i did a lot more of my my curating of events and experiences because a big part of what um we're trying to do with coca-cola is tap into that localization and that personalization for our customers. So like I said, meeting them in the moments that matter most to our customers. So if you're a big Red Sox fan and you're at Fenway, you're already experiencing something that you love that's filled with enjoyment. And we all know Fenway has its own ambiance. We want Coke to be in your hand and you, we want you to taste it while you're feeling that enjoyment and that uplifting moment. Um, so that was the best part of my job is kind of mirroring and bringing those two things together. That's awesome. Well, the whole premise of my podcast is connecting with people either in person or online or ideally both. Yep. I don't think you can just do one. You can't just do online. You can't just do in person. So I'm sure you have strategies and tactics in place to extend that relationship once you've met people either online yeah, or absolutely. in person. And I think um, you know it's an interesting time to be in right now because we have got so many different um, generations representing our customers right now, right? So you've got um, baby boomers and Gen Xers that may not be as technologically savvy as your millennials and your centennials. So that we have to um, be able to speak to both of them where they're ready to receive information. So online, social, digital, that might be more your millennials and your centennials, but your baby boomers and your Gen Xers really want to feel and taste and touch and they're more about um, that in-person experience. So you can't just go down one channel and solely focus on that because you're going to miss half of your, your customer base. Um, and then to your point, also translating that experience both online and digitally and then in person. Um, so it, it's definitely a challenge and each one has its own strategy and its own approach. Um, they're, they're very different and how we we showcase our brands are very different in each of those spaces. Um, and I'd argue we're still trying to figure it out and technology is moving faster than we can even figure it out, come up with a strategy, go to an agency, implement it. And then by the time you look up, you're like, oh, that's already outdated. Right. Um, we actually had a slide that they just showed it, um, at Coke that Back in like the 1900s, human knowledge doubled every 50 years, um, and now it's doubling every 12 years, and soon it's going to double every 12 hours. And that's wow, how that's fast we're moving. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, how are we preparing for that? How do we plan to keep up with that? Um, you know, is it gonna, is there is there going to be a tipping point where that's no longer true? Um, so that's kind of the the forethought we're thinking about at Coke. Yeah. So when you have an event, for example, a Red Sox game, and you've got people there with their Cokes, are you trying to get them to engage with you also by posting an Instagram or a Snapchat story? Are you you delving? Are you trying to get their email address? How are you trying to make that connection? Yeah. So I think we're, we're trying to speak to our um, consumers. We call it the pre-shop, um, the during shop, and the post shop. And that could be in retail. So we're saying shop like as if you're going to a retail store. But from a stadium perspective, you know, that could be as they're preparing at home for their in-stadium experience. Now they're in stadium, they're experiencing your brand. And then what are they thinking about your brand once they leave the Red Sox game? So we want to hit them at both at all three of those stages of how they're absorbing both the brand of the Red Sox and brand Coca-Cola. Um, so we have a, a great partnership with Major League Baseball. Um, and because of that, we are able to leverage social digital with our um, with our MLB team. So not to get too in the weeds with trademark, but part of my job is to understand trademark law and our trademark rights. Um, so we have different relationships with each of the MLB clubs. We have um, partnerships with 18 of the MLB teams across the country. Um, which means that we pour at those stadiums. You can get a Coke product exclusively at those stadiums. It also means that we have the rights to use their logos, their fonts, their colors. I mean, every little piece of their visual ID is part of their trademark. And their players? The players are different. So the players are part of the um, Players Association, and you have to have individual relationships with any of the players. Um but again, that's, you know, you can come up with creative ways to work around that. You know, we have player appearances, of course, built into our contract with them. But, you know, asking to take a photo of, of a player holding a Coke bottle, that would be a totally a personal decision by them and their agent. And they may want to have their own one-off deal. But part of our job is to know all of those ins and outs and what we can or can't do and um, the creative ways to skirt around it. Like you can with a player, but if they're not in a Red Sox jersey. So do we put them in a Coke t-shirt? 
you know, just to get kind of skirt that way of using the trademark. So, um, so where I was going with it is that, you know, you can have individual club relationships, um, but then there's one big league relationship that a soft drink would own. That would be the official beverage of the NHL or the or Pepsi is the official beverage of the NFL. Um, so we recently just became the official beverage of Major League Baseball two years ago. And what that did was it opened up all of our ability to use the social digital rights for our clubs because they actually sit with Major League Baseball and not the individual clubs. So as I understand it, like right when social media was becoming kind of booming, let's call it, I don't know, 2005 maybe, maybe early 2000s, um, it stressed teams out. They didn't know how to use social digital. They looked at this as a burden or very expensive, or now we've got to add headcount just to manage our social digital. Um, so people were still trying to figure it out. And Major League Baseball said, oh, don't worry, we'll we'll own your digital rights. You don't have to worry about it. We'll manage this for you. And so Major League Baseball took the social digital rights and they've had them since. So really, they're managing all the club team's social digital presence. You know, they're, they're doing it in partnership and each club is their own team. But just because we have a relationship with the Red Sox doesn't mean that we can use use their social digital presence without permission from Major League Baseball. So becoming the official beverage of Major League Baseball opened up that avenue for us. Um, so long story short, to answer your question, we are trying to ha- um, leverage the social digital presence of such a great club. Red Sox actually rank number one of all MLB teams with their social followers and their engagements. Um, and maybe we have something going on in stadium where um, we recently did an activation called Military Message in a Bottle where fans could write a message um, thanking a, a current serviceman or woman and scroll the message up, put it in an empty Coke bottle. And then we've been delivering those bottles to military bases at home and abroad, um, which has been a very successful and, and meaningful activation for us. Um, so we'll use the Red Sox you know, social network to shout out to fans, hey, this is happening. If you want to come into Fenway this week, you'll be able to write your own message, alert them to that happening in Concourse A. We then get you know fans driven to our, our activation and can engage with them about our brands and about our uh, special partnership with the USO and kind of talk to them about that. Um, and then, you know, after they leave the stadium, you know, maybe they've got their souvenir cup in their hand, or maybe they've just got this great feeling about how Coke is, is, bigger than just a beverage company, but we're a, we're a humanitarian company and we are trying to bring people together and give thanks to local communities and give thanks where thanks is due. And um, it's more about that that brand awareness and that impressionism as they leave, as they right, leave the stadium. Yeah. Well, I think that obviously Red Sox Nation, I mean, that is like, that should be in the dictionary next to I the know. word brand, <laughs> because I mean, it is just such a great example of how people, it's it's in their DNA that they're Red Sox fans. Absolutely. And of course, to for Coca-Cola to be tapping into that and that marketing partnership sounds like it's just you know, it's, magic. it's absolutely ma- magical. And um, the two brands by themselves just have such a synergy. Um, we actually have the longest relationship in sports is the Red Sox and Coca-Cola. It's 107 years. Wow. Um, so we are one of their first official partners. Um, I don't think we're going anywhere. I think we're both in it for the long haul. Um, so like what a what an absolute dream come true to work for Coke on that account. And I actually ended up working on it during um, Big Poppy's retirement. Oh, yeah. um, so just the timing of that, I managed um, his final season contract for Coke. So we actually brought David Ortiz on uh, as a Coke ambassador for his last year. And it just so happened I'm in the role when that happened. I mean, that talk about that timing. It was wow. absolutely incredible. So we actually did a great campaign with him when you talk about leveraging uh, social digital is um, so of the Red Sox, like I said, they have the number one um, social media presence of any team. David Ortiz has the number one social presence of any player. And even now through retirement, he has the highest amount of followers and social engagement. Um, So we knew we had to do something, you know, with him socially and digitally and came up with this great campaign that um, wasn't too Coke forward. So kind of getting back into that, you know, we want to meet our fans where they are. They are celebrating what David has meant to Boston and New England. They're celebrating his amazing career. We don't want to 
overtake that moment and make it about Coke because it's not. It's about celebrating this guy and celebrating this community that has supported him so much. Um, So we did this amazing Instagram um, post. We actually did a photo shoot with him and his son. Um, He was in um, this like red blazer, this red jacket, and um, he was walking out of the tunnel of Fenway for the last time, leaving Fenway. And he had a Coke bottle in his hand and his arm around his son. And the tagline was, every walk off ends at home. And it was just this very emotional moment of he's walking off for the last time. And we know, you know, obviously the double entendre of, you know, his walk off home runs, which he's famous for. They end at home plate and his lack, his last walk off from Fenway is going to end at home with his son. Um, and, you know, it's just the subtlety of having Coke in his hand and Coke being part of that celebratory moment um, was unbelievable. We had the Coke LED, that famous LED sign at Fenway in the background. And, you know, it was just this this great moment to be able to celebrate this guy who's part of the Coke family and part of Red Sox Nation. And um, to be part of something like that is just, That's, it makes you excited to work for the brand yeah. that I work for. Yeah. Well, I just have to mention, because you're talking about the Coca-Cola sign at Fenway, yeah. my great-grandfather was one of the people that introduced Neon into the United States. Stop and it. And he owned a sign company, the Brink Sign Company, okay. and built the Sitco sign. That's Which is <laughs> like the beacon of everything at Fenway. No way. Yeah, so that's one of my uh, what family's a small world. claims to fame. <laughs> I love it. I, lo- I know. That's going nowhere. Yeah, that is. Right. We used to have... Um, these Coke bottles up in left field before they even had seats on the Green Monster. I think they got taken away in 2004, and people threw a fit that the Coke bottles were leaving Fenway. And we ended up replacing them with that um, sign out in on the third baseline. So you know you're kind of repurposing and and moving, and you you know change is good sometimes, but. I mean, the public reaction of removing the Coke bottles, I can't imagine if they removed the oh, Sitco right. yeah. sign. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think yeah. that would go over well. <laughs> well, it has it has changed. It's not it's not the original, but there is still a Sitco sign there. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to just go to a quick break, but this is just a fascinating <laughs> conversation. There is just so much I could delve into. And I want to come back and uh, talk about a little bit about, about PR and social media. But first, we're going to go to a little commercial for the Marshall Plan, which is something that I have a trademark on. Um, But also, if you want to win a copy of my book, which is PR Works and a PR Maven Nation Things to Do Pad, go to prmaven.com slash giveaway, and you could be our next winner. And we'll be back in just a moment with more from Katie Rollins, Del Signore. This podcast is all about growing your network in order to strengthen your brand. In my 30 plus year marketing and PR career, I have seen many organizations waste their precious time and money on marketing because they're trying to obtain success without any strategy to achieve their goals. So many organizations and companies suffer from what I call the shiny object syndrome, trying every new fad that comes down the pike. That's why I created the Marshall Plan 15 years ago We have done over 100 of these plans for clients, helping them to get out of their day-to-day routine to identify their goals, solidify their brand story, focus in on their ideal customer avatar, analyze their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and create a realistic budget and measurement dashboard. We create the Marshall Plan collaboratively with our clients over the course of three months. We have a 65-step process to create a highly customized, actionable plan. And it's not like we come in and say, we are the consultants from away and we know everything. Instead, we come in and say, let's sit down at the table with your leadership team and we'll bring our expertise in what's working in PR and marketing. And our client team brings their knowledge of what's working in their organization. And together, we come up with a really amazing plan. For many, it's been a transformative process. I have watched how teams have come together and their faces light up because they have such a sense of accomplishment and they're so excited about the future of their organization. We help our client figure out the best way to implement the plan, sometimes using people within their organization and sometimes with our help. We would love to chat with you about how you can expand your network 
and achieve your marketing goals with a Marshall Plan. Go to marshallpr.com slash marshallplan to learn more about the process or better yet, send me an email at nancy at prmaven.com and we'll set up a time to talk and get started. And now back to our conversation. Welcome back. And today we're here talking with Katie Rollins Del Signori, who's the Senior Shopper Marketing Manager at Coca-Cola. And I want to dive right back in with our really interesting conversation. And Katie, at Coca-Cola, obviously, you have a very complex marketing and PR and social organization. Can you talk about the different departments and kind of how you divide up responsibilities and also how you work together? Yeah, absolutely. And it it is complex and we're a global brand, which adds a level of complexity to it. Um, So I work for Coca-Cola North America. Um, We are the North American business unit. So when you're talking about anything within my my business, you're strictly talking the continent of North America. So we're, you know, obviously we are a global brand. So we've got to break it out like that. Um, But our, our world headquarters is in Atlanta. Um, so we've got um, PR and social and marketing teams that sit in Atlanta that kind of look at it from a, a, a country perspective, like a North America or the con- continental perspective, I should say. Um, but then you also have local teams that sit in each region that can address um, local opportunities or, or local questions. So it's important to know that, you know, we've got a headquarter team that kind of devises strategy and and communicates that out and then it's all of our jobs to implement that strategy um so we do have three kind of separate teams we've got a a PAC team political action committee um, that handles a lot of our pr questions and resources so if the boston globe was going to do a story on coke we would filter through our PAC team um they often send out emails like hey Soda tax is becoming an issue in your region. Here's what we think about it. Here's our stance on it. Here's some talking points. You know, at Coca Cola, we truly believe each of our employees is our best brand ambassadors. So they want to make sure that we're all on the same page about how we feel about this, the research that might be done on sugary beverages. You know, that's often a controversial topic. And whether you believe it or not, you know, I'm I'm holding a a Diet Coke in my hand and people will come up to you totally unprovoked and like, oh, don't drink that stuff. It's bad for you. And we've got to have an answer for that. And I don't think it's bad for you. And I think there's moments in every day where you can reward and treat yourself. And that's not a PR line. I truly believe that. And, um, And so, you know, we work a lot with them on brand ambassadorship. We also, um, the PAC committee will also work with our legislatures um, and all of our congressmen and um, local government on community events or initiatives or how Coke can donate back to the community. Um, You know, there's a lot of legislation on sugary beverages and making sure that we're part of that conversation. And we want to be part of everyone's um, healthy lifestyle. And we're more than just a soda company. We have, um, you know, Smart Water, Dasani, Vitamin Water, Simply Juices, Honest Tea, Gold Peak Tea. So I think it's really important as part of that PR committee to let people know that we have over 180 brands in North America. So if you don't want to drink our soda, that's fine. We'd like you to drink one of our products. And if water's your your go-to, we've got a couple of those too. So, um, you know, it's just about um, making sure that we're putting our best foot forward and that we're being our best and brand ambassadors as well. So we've got a whole team for kind of those sides of the questions. Um, we also have a social digital team um, that's based in Atlanta um, that helps a lot with our national strategy. So Coke's made the decision um, to not do too much locally um, on the Coke uh, handles, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It really is about that global brand and keeping it global. Um, one thing that we're doing actually, um, which is fun to talk about, is um, the new Coke that came out in 1986, which I think is like an epic failure. Everyone agree, <laughs> right? It was out yeah, for right. like two or three weeks. We changed the the recipe of Coke and we thought it would just set the world on fire and no one liked it. And they took it off the shelves after three weeks. And I think business schools study it as just like this this case study of just a very bad move done by a very successful company. And now we're partnering with Stranger Things, the Netflix series, because it sets place in 1986 and new Coke is part of their storyline. And Coke is actually re-releasing new Coke only through their social digital platforms. You can order it online and have it shipped to you. It's the only place that you can buy it. But it's sort of, and now it's flying off the online e-commerce shelves. And you're like, how did this epic failure, you know, 
30 years ago turn into this. Now we're just going to repurpose it and kind of laugh at ourselves instead of being laughed at. And I think that's the power of our social digital team is to to engage um, a whole new generation of consumers that never got to try this infamous fail. And now they want to try it and we're capitalizing on it. And I think it's something that only can come to life in e-commerce. It wouldn't fly off the retail shelves at a brick and mortar. Um, so we have a whole team that's, you know, conducting that campaign. Um, and they've got a whole set of um, rules and regulations. Um, so it's very interesting to learn about how they operate in this social digital space. Um, I was actually just learning it more in Atlanta. And um, for instance, if you tweet at Diet Coke, they will respond, um, but they can only respond once unless you tag them again. So let's say you said, oh, I love you know, my at Diet Coke in the morning, it gives me that pickup I need, they may respond and say, oh, thanks, Nancy, like, we love Diet Coke, too. Like, thanks for being a fan. And then if you asked a question just in that conversation, but did not tag them again, they are not legally allowed to respond. Um, So there's a lot of uh, a lot of rules and guidelines to how we engage with our with our social and digital um, presence and our and our customers. Um, and I think that's ever evolving as we still figure out our own strategies. Um, but all of that, you know, PR and social is still so different than how Coke defines their marketing roles. Um, so myself as a senior shopper marketer, I'm really customer focused and each major um, retailer has a shopper marketing team. Um, so our job is to customize our Coke portfolio and our approach for the retailer that we're working on. Um, so for me right now, it's CVS Pharmacies. I'm the senior shopper marketing manager for our portfolio nationally at CVS. Um, but there's a me for Walgreens. There's a me for Family Dollar. There's a me for Dollar General. There's a me for Walmart, for um, Shaw's and Star Market. Um, and we don't we don't overlap very purposefully. We want to keep it a competitive advantage, even internally. We don't share what our ad calendars look like. We don't share what our price package plan looks like. Um, it's in everybody's best interest to compete against each other um, to grow our retailers' business. Um, so we like to keep that approach, um, and you know I think that's important for our integrity and are important for our integrity with our customers that they can trust us and they they know that we have their category growth, the beverage category, um, their their category growth best at heart. Um, and, you know, obviously we have confidence in our brands that if the category grows, then Coke grows. Um, so, you know, we try to put together in-store marketing plans and out-of-store media buys that are going to promote our beverages at our respective retailer. So for my, my job is, you know, Nancy, you come in with a Diet Coke and I want to make sure that you bought it at CVS. Right. Yeah. So like, do you visit CVS stores all over the country? All over the country, <laughs> all the time. And my poor husband will be driving and I'm like, there's a CVS. We should stop and see <laughs> see what the Coke looks like. And, and do you so, introduce yourself? I do. I do. Every time I introduce myself to anyone that's on um, on the clock or a store manager and, you know, I'll ask them, how's Coke treating you and what's your delivery like and that's your service like. And I think, you know, that's probably not totally necessary all the time, but um, but I like what I do you're and I care about ambassador. it totally. And I think if, if if you like what you do and you're passionate, then you're living and breathing it. And you know if if you're if you're not totally right, like you've got to embody yeah. you know what you believe in and um and so yeah, so we'll we'll visit and um I'm just I think I'm probably just brainwashed. Like I'll see the cooler and our labels will be turned so you can't see the word Coke and I'll just start facing the labels and turning them all so the cooler looks perfect and yeah. um you know, you just can't turn it off if if you like if you like what you do. Right. Um, and I think that's a really important piece is making sure that it's just inherently how you live and think and you know, I've got I've got friends that'll say, you know, um and I'm like, what, what, you're always drinking a Coke beverage. Do you ever drink a non-Coke beverage? And I'm like, absolutely not. And they're like, why would you get in trouble? I'm like, well, it wouldn't even matter if I got in trouble. I don't, I don't want to drink a non-Coke beverage. I genuinely believe in the brands that we represent. I genuinely think they taste better, first of all. But also, you know, if I'm working 40, 50, 60 hours a week to grow that extra 1%, imagine if every employee at Coke was drinking a competitor's beverage it would be net net, right. you know, right? So it's like you you're working so hard to build the brands that you love. Why would you turn around and, and not be loyal to them? So to me, it just it doesn't add up. It's kind of the obvious answer. 
Um, but I think, you know, it's all about that passion point and, and believing in the stuff that you're representing. Kind of reminds me of when I helped launch Cold River Vodka, which is Maine's own potato vodka <laughs> brand. And I felt out of loyalty to the brand, I needed to start drinking like several Cosmopolitans every night. Right? You <laughs> are your know. best brand ambassador. <laughs> and then at a certain point, I'm like, uh, I think I better scale this back a little. <laughs> it's a little easier with soda and yeah, tea. Right. Yeah, I like it though. You're like Tito's. What? No. Yeah. Cold River. So, Katie, most successful people have a network of fans or followers, either online or in person, or both. Have you developed your network personally and professionally, intentionally, or has it happened on its own? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think there's various approaches that people take. I've seen um, people have, you know, um, assigned mentors that they meet with every month and they're very deliberate about it. Um, There's a lot of women's networking events um, that people attend and are pretty religious about that as well. Um, I've found the most success comes from when you're not trying, when you're kind of being your authentic best self and it just kind of organically comes about like my first job at Coke was just kind of this organic informal mentorship that I'd had and it worked out perfectly. I find that um, it's it's hard to force a relationship. Um, but I definitely think that there's moments where you have to force yourself to get out of your comfort zone in order to make those relationships. So part of what I'm learning is, you know, it's really easy to to make excuses and not attend an event or to be tired after a long day and not want to go to a dinner or want to go to a game. And um, I think some of the best relationships I have were formed over a, a glass of wine, um, you know, at a, at a company dinner or, you know, chatting about their kids and their family and their interests and totally taking business off the table and just relating to people on a humanity level. Um, you know, it, it, it drastically changes the way you operate and the way you partner in business. Um, but I think it can't be contrived. It can't be forced. It needs to be very authentic. And um, I think, you know, it kind of comes back to the passion point, too. If you live and breathe your business, people can see it all over your face before you even open up your PowerPoint, before you even turn on your computer. There's a, a vibe and an energy and an excitement. And I think if you can take over a room with that, then people will gravitate towards you. And that's kind of the way I've I've operated is I want to be solution oriented. I want to be positive. I want to um, love my brands. I want to um show my brand love on my face. And I think that people really gravitate towards that. And, um, you know, you can you know, win people over out of the boardroom, if you Well, I, I'm just smiling because the reason that you and I are sitting here together right now is because I had a meeting with your father, who's yes. the mayor of the city of Augusta, <laughs> Maine, and who, he, who is very enthusiastic, not only about his, well, his position with Augusta, but about his daughter. I mean, he is He's so my th- biggest fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He is definitely your biggest fan. But he and I connect on that whole level of enthusiasm and totally. like being, you know, just it's contagious. It and, is. Uh, so, yeah, he and I were talking and then I was talking about my podcast and then he was talking about your job. And I'm like, oh. We and, have see, to and, have it, her. <laughs> and it all comes to life. It's not like he's, you know, sought you out and was like, hey, my daughter's great and you got to have her on your podcast. It's like, well, you just share in this mutual enthusiasm and, you know, what great things can come from that when good people kind of put their heads together. And um, my uh, high school basketball coach, so I played basketball at uh, Coney High School in Augusta and Paul Vashon um, was my basketball coach. He's like the very, very successful um, coach in his own right. And he used to tell us nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Love and that's that. stuck with me. And it's a very simple principle that I think people are losing. You know, we're all tired. We're all overworked. We're all stressed out. We can't even put our work away because our phones are beeping all the time. I mean, I think it's really easy to lose perspective. And then, you know, I, I go home sometimes. I'm like, okay, come on. I sell liquid. Like that's what, like we're not you know we're not solving world peace and world hunger here. Right. We're selling beverages and we need to like keep some perspective here and we need to like what we're doing because at the end of the day, you know I gotta I want to you know wake up with a smile on my face and be excited to go to work. Yeah, well I think that's gonna have to be the tweet from this episode. <laughs> Nothing was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Yes. from Coach Paul Vashon. Paul Vashon quote it, which he might have stolen from somebody else. So we <laughs> yeah. might want to Google it yeah, before well, we attribute it to him. I love that. 
So, Katie, what is one parting thought you would like to share with PR Maven Nation today? Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm so grateful to be here, and thank you for having me. Like, I just, I love talking, you know, brand Coke, and I hope, um, you know, I hope I was able to share some forms of wisdom. Um, you know, I, I, I think that it, the positivity is contagious. I think there's a lot to be said about work ethic and grinding through it. So we sit Love here, that. right? Like we, we sit here and we talk about all these fun things and all the success, but um, you know, there's a journey behind it. And I think that, um, you know, my dad always says, you know, put cookies in the cookie jar. So, you know, work your butt off, do 20% more of your work, keep putting cookies in the cookie jar. And when it pays off, you can take a couple cookies out now and then. <laughs> um, and I think that's a big part of my, my journey is, um, you know, grind it out, do the early mornings, do the things no one else is willing to do. And your your game, your work will speak for itself and you'll get opportunities that you never even thought possible just because, you know, your work ethic and, and what you exude um, as a team member. So that's probably my biggest piece of advice is be the team member that you, you want to have on a team. I agree with you 1000%. And the other thing is I I feel like I've been doing that since I was out of college and mm -hmm. people keep saying to me, oh, aren't you kind of like scaling back? Aren't you slowing down? I'm like, no, <laughs> I feel like I'm just getting started. Yes. <laughs> and having a podcast has allowed me to just, just have this whole new breath of fresh air in my career. I think I just it just evolves. It. Like, you yeah, know, it's exactly. slowing down, quote unquote. It's not, you're changing, you're evolving, you're evolving with the times, you're evolving with your passions and where you know, branding and marketing and PR takes you is where you're going to be. So that, I mean, if you're staying in one spot, you're not you're not moving forward, right? So I don't totally. think you're slowing down. You're just changing direction. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. And if anyone who's listening wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn as Katie Rollins Del Signori. I'm also on Twitter at, at Katie Rollins which I have not updated yet for my, my new married <laughs> name, but we'll get there. Uh, so brand Katie Rollins still exists on the internet. <laughs> and it's K-A-T-I-E yes. Rollins. Okay, yes. Great. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from anybody, answer any questions, and you know, just engage with any of your listeners. This has been super fun. Yeah, well, I've I've had a really good time too, and I'm honored you drove all the way up from Boston. It's to not that far. The it's, still <laughs> it's still home. It's still home. Well, we're here at the Portland Pod in South Portland, Maine, and uh, it's so much fun to sit here and chat with you. And I hope maybe we can do another episode. And I think that would be uh, just really interesting to take the conversation to the next level. I would love to. Anytime you have me back, I'm here. Well, thank you, Katie. And thank you, PR Maven Nation, for tuning in today. And as always, to access full episodes of the PR Maven podcast, including all the show notes where we will have links uh, to everything we referenced today, including the documentary uh, about Katie and her roommate after they played basketball at Harvard, uh, go to prmaven.com slash podcast. And as always, be sure to rate and subscribe and review because that's the fuel that keeps us going here. So thank you. That's it for this week's episode. I'd like to thank you for listening. And if you feel that you've gotten value out of today's conversation, consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes or whatever app you're using to tune in. If you haven't subscribed yet, you should do so. I release a new episode each week and subscribing will make sure you get an alert when there's a new episode. You can also join the PR Maven Nation by going to prmaven.com slash nation and clicking join. It's free and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you have an Alexa-enabled device, be sure to add the PR Maven Marketing Minute to your daily flash briefing menu. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.